Thank you. So I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to speak here. I was fortunate to meet both Jean-Pierre Demailly and Nassim Siboni at quite a few conferences, especially Nassim Siboni some 25 years ago was visiting my advisor, John Eric Forness, in Ann Arbor, and he gave an excellent course on pluripotential theory, Hormann, der Dibar estimates, and so on. So, <coughs> Okay, so to, to begin here, I'm going to discuss some results about extension of quasi-plurisubharmonic functions, which is joint work with uh, Gedge and Zeriahi. And uh, <coughs> the plan would be to state these problems, and then what, our, what are our newest results here, and then to discuss some uh, reciprocal results when you have uh, the extension property going, what sort of positivity properties should the class have. So to, to begin, X will be a compact Kähler manifold, omega Kähler form, dimension will be N, and X is a an analytic sub right analytic subset of V. And then there are the classes of omega plurisubharmonic functions. So uh, they were already introduced and uh, used in quite a few talks. Quasi plurisubharmonic means locally the sum of smooth and plurisubharmonic function. And then uh, uh, you put a lower bound on the curvature in this way, and you get omega plurisubharmonic function. And then strictly omega plurisubharmonic function, so this plus here, you require that this current is a Kähler current, so it dominates a small multiple of the, of the Kähler form. Uh, so uh, these are classes that were used a lot in complex geometry, very useful. They were considered systematically by Jean-Pierre de Mailly, for example, in connection to singular metrics on uh, holomorphic line bundles and to many questions in complex geometry. And since there are no plurisubharmonic functions except for constants, they are the replacement when you want to study pluripotential theory on a compact Euler manifold. It turned out that they had a lot of applications to complex dynamics in higher dimensions, starting with the work of Forness and Siboni. And one more thing here, they give global potentials for positive closed currents of B degree 1, 1 in the cohomology class of omega. So now we are going to consider the same objects, but on the analytic subset X. So here's a precise definition. It models basically the definition of a plurisubharmonic function on, a, on an analytic subset. So it should extend in an ambient space to a plurisubharmonic function. So the same thing is going on here. For every point in X, you should have an open neighborhood in the manifold in V. And on that neighborhood, you should have a Kähler potential rho, so smooth function with DDC equal to omega, and a plurisubharmonic function psi on U as well, so that rho plus phi is equal to psi on the portion of the subset, analytic subset X that lies in U. So that's the definition of a omega plurisubharmonic function on X. And now it can happen that this plurisubharmonic function psi is in fact strictly plurisubharmonic. And when that happens, you have a strictly plurisubharmonic omega plurisubharmonic function on, on X. And that's equivalent to this, in fact. So, All right, so the extension problem is suppose that you are given such an object on X can you find an omega plurisubharmonic function on V so that phi is the restriction of that function to X? So in other words, do you have this equality? One inclusion is, of course, obvious by restriction. Global objects give you objects on X. And uh, one can ask the same question for uh, the class of strictly omega plurisubharmonic functions. If you have a strictly plurisubharmonic function on X, is it possible to extend it to a strictly plurisubharmonic function on V? Uh, when you have extra positivity, so in this plus class, the problem is a bit easier, as already you know, uh, is known from the classical theorem of Rigberg of approximation of strictly plurisubharmonic functions. So I start by listing some results in that case. 
So there is a result in the smooth case here. So if x is a, not an analytic subset, but actually a smooth submanifold, and you start with a smooth strictly pre subharmonic function on x, then it is possible to extend it to a smooth strictly pre subharmonic function on v. That's not difficult to do. One actually uses the square of the distance to x to extend locally, and then you extend globally. And this was uh, noticed so far as uh, the first time by Schumacher in the case of a Hodge form, and then the proof can be easily adapted to the general Kähler case. So after, uh, after this, there is a result of, of Collins and Tosati from 2014. And again, x is supposed to be smooth, so submanifold. And the function is also uh, nice, smooth, but with analytic singularities. It can have analytic singularities on x. And in that case, you can extend it to a strictly plurisubharmonic function on v. Uh, the same argument can be adapted to a slightly more general situ situation. And it was done recently by Meng and Wang. But it's essentially the same argument as there, as they note themselves. So again, x is smooth, not analytic subset, no singularities. And the uh, strictly plurisubharmonic function on x is just continuous, but the polar set is finite. Now, continuity, of course, we understand it allowing minus infinity as a value. Or if you prefer, you can say that e to the power phi is continuous. And for such objects, you can extend them to continuous strictly plurisubharmonic functions on v, again, allowing minus infinity as a value. So this is some sort of results that uh, prove extension in the case when the function is special. Another direction is to look at what sort of properties x has to have in order to have the extension going. And uh, from last year, a, a result of Ning, Wang, and Zhu says the following. So again, x has to be smooth, some manifold. And you require that there is a retraction, holomorphic retra retraction from an open neighborhood u of x in v onto x. And if you have this geometric structure for x, then you can extend strictly plurisubharmonic functions from x to strictly plurisubharmonic functions on v. So these are the results that I'm aware of so far in the case of strictly plurisubharmonic functions. All of them assume that x is smooth. And uh, what we were doing with Gage and Zeriahi was to consider the problem of extension of just omega plurisubharmonic functions, so no extra positivity. So let's go. Uh, I jumped too much. Yeah, here. All right, so in the case when there is no extra positivity, we have a result from 2013. And it is referring to special Kähler forms. So omega is supposed to be Hodge form, so integral class. Or in other words, omega is uh, in the churn class of, a, of an ample line bundle on x. And of course, then uh, v has to be projective. <coughs> But now x can be with singularities as well. So if you have just an analytic subset and with these special Kähler forms, then the extension is always possible without extra positivity. So any omega plurisubharmonic function on x always extend to an omega plurisubharmonic function on, on v. So I will say something about the proof of a more general case in a moment. But for now, just note that in fact, in such a situation, you are in Pn, because you can embed v in Pn. And a multiple of omega, in fact, is the pullback of the Fubini study form. So multiples don't matter in this problem. And then the idea is that you cover Pn by standard affine charts, the standard embedding of Cn to Pn. And one can use extension of plurisubharmonic functions on Stein manifolds. So that is actually a corollary of this theorem. So uh, you have now a Stein manifold. You have an analytic subset. 
And the theorem is about extension with, uh, with growth control. So you are given a continuous plurisubharmonic exhaustion function, u of m. And your function on x, so on the, sub, an, on the analytic subset, plurisubharmonic function phi, is dominated by u. And then you can always extend phi to a global plurisubharmonic function on m, but you lose a little bit in the control, so you cannot do it with c equal to 1, but for every constant c bigger than 1, there is an extension that is dominated by c times u on, on m. And the theorem relies on uh, some deep results of Kolsoyo about uh, traces of Runge domains on analytic subsets, and using that, he proved such an extension theorem not with, uh, with growth control on the whole CN. I mean, M could be taken to be CN by embedding it in there. But he proved something of the following form. So if I have a polynomially convex compact set, maybe I should write this, or draw a picture. So here is X, and here is K. So K is a polynomially convex compact set in CN. And the function that we have here is less than 0 on K intersect with the sub-variety X. And then the extension can be chosen so that phi tilde, the extension, is less than 0 on K. So such a thing. And somehow, using this result, we were able to prove that theorem. And then from that, as I discuss in a moment, one can move on to the case of omega plurisubharmonic functions in the compact setting. All right, so, so now, in fact, the next uh, notions and the theorem is modeling uh, the proof of PN, so it's not entirely new from that point of view. So we need the following uh, concept. So adapted Zariski open Stein cover. So you start with a compact Kähler manifold and fix a Kähler form omega always. And you say that there exists an adapted Zariski open Stein cover of V and omega, or in short, that V omega verifies condition ZOS if the following two conditions are met. So you should be able to find a finite open cover of V by Stein open sets that are Zariski dense. So the complement of Vj is an analytic subset. And this cover should be adapted to omega. So that's sort of the name there. Meaning that on each Vj, there is a potential, a plurisubharmonic potential of omega, rho j. But you require more than just that. You require that it is an exhaustion function of, of Vj. The condition, once again, to emphasize, it depends on both V and omega. So if you change the Kähler form, the, the Kähler class, actually, it might still have the same property for a different omega with a different cover, Vj. OK, so in this setting, if you have such a compact Kähler manifold verifying the above condition and x any analytic subset, then the extension property holds for uh, omega and x. Any omega plurisubharmonic function on x extends to a global omega plurisubharmonic function on v. So I will perhaps say just one word. It's not a proof or anything, just to, an idea to indicate how that reduces to the previous case of Stein manifolds. And uh, so suppose that I have our omega plurisubharmonic function on x. And I can take it to be negative. It's bounded above anyway. And I fix a constant c bigger than 1. And then on vj, we have the exhaustion rho j. So if you look at rho j plus phi, this is a plurisubharmonic function on x intersect with vj. 
one element of this cover and it is definitely less than rho j because phi is negative so you can extend it by the Stein case You can extend it, then the extension will be dominated by this constant times rho j. And then if you fix a slightly smaller constant, so maybe I call it C prime, and you subtract the potential, so uh, Maybe now I call this psi j, so let's look at this psi tilde minus, minus c times rho j. So this object is now c omega plurisubharmonic on vj. And yeah, so here is the c prime. It's important to extend with something a bit less than c because then this thing goes to minus infinity on, uh, on the complement of Vj. That I called Hj. And it's not, it's not quite an extension because you have this C that is bigger than 1. But uh, on the su analytic subset X, this is going to be equal to what you want and then minus this correction term that is there. But C is very close to 1. So this is on x intersect with vj. And at the points at infinity, so to speak, both sides are minus infinity. So therefore, on x. This, of course, extends, extends to a C omega plurisubharmonic function at the points of that analytic subset, because it's upper bounded, standard extension theorem. So you got this in each chart Vj, and you take the maximum. And this is now, you lose a little bit of positivity. And on x, You don't quite get the extension, but you're not too far from it. And the term there is, in fact, each term is omega plurisubharmonic on the, on the whole manifold V. And this is a continuous, finite continuous. All right, so this is sort of part of the idea. Then one has to be careful and also introduce a decreasing sequence of approximants here. So we are going to work with some other function there in an induction step. But the offshot is that using this, one constructs a sequence of, uh, well, maybe by that we can skip because we divide by it as well. Uh, maybe I write it like this. So, so a sequence of epsilon j that decreases to zero, and uh, c j are uh, c j omega plurisubharmonic on V. And they decrease to phi, and they are smooth as well, C infinity smooth, by using in this process the Demai regularization theorem. So in fact, the, the construction of the extension, right? So this is uh, decreasing also on, on V as well on the whole manifold and having phi as a limit 
on x. So the limit is going to be the extension. The limit of that decreasing sequence is going to be the extension. And it also gives you the smoothing of phi, because these guys are smooth. So along x, phi is approximated by the decreasing sequence of smooth omega plurisubharmonic functions. All right, so I don't want to go too much into details with this. It's some construction of sequences of decreasing functions, induction, and so on. So I guess I will stop here. And more interestingly, let's uh, look at this uh, property, the ZOS property. So there are some basic properties that are uh, easy to to see, they are, they are listed here. So uh, of course, the projective space verifies this condition. If you think of the potential of the Fubini study logarithm of uh, 1 plus norm squared, it's an exhaustion on Cn. Then it's easy to see that uh, by taking submanifolds, the condition is preserved. So if W is a smooth submanifold of V, then it will also have the property. Also, the product is preserved. So you got two manifolds that have this property. And then for the product, you take the standard product Kähler form. And uh, that will have this property. Then the, the DD bar lemma tells you that, in fact, this condition is depending only on the class of the Kähler form. So in other words, if you take a Kähler form in the same cohomology class, let's say omega prime, and if omega has the ZOS property, so will the other Kähler form, omega prime. And uh, because of the submanifold uh, property, it's easy to see that Hodge forms will have this, this property by using Kodaira embedding, embedding theorem, as explained before. You are in projective space. And the next remark is the more interesting one. So ah, thank you. So if you, if you look at the set of Kähler classes, so KV denotes the Kähler cone of V, and you look at the set of these classes so that for a Kähler representative, V omega verifies the ZOS property, this is a convex cone. And Maybe I will, I, will, I will say this here. It's, again, not difficult to see, but. So uh, what does that mean? It means that I have two Kähler forms. And I have positive constants, and then you want to show that this combination of them also has the property. And like I said, it's very easy to check. So basically, you got two covers. So on the first cover, finite cover, of course, you got the the Kähler potentials for omega j that are exhaustions. And then there is another cover, uh, omega 1, I guess, here. And you have the eta k, let's say exhaustion on WK, plurisubharmonic, strongly plurisubharmonic. And then, of course, this is covered by their intersection, which is still Stein. And the right function that you look is just the linear combination. And it's an exhaustion of that. 
And of course, the complement of this is the union of the complement, so it's still an analytic, analytic set, those HJs that were there before. So that immediately justifies this remark. And the remark is uh, very useful because it allows us to move away from the Hodge classes to the neuron severity space. So I recall here the neuron severity group of V consists of churn classes of line bundles. And uh, then you think of it as a vector space over R by this tensoring construction, and you get the neuron severity space. And then if you have a Kähler form or a Kähler class in the neuron severity space, it's known that you can always write it as a combination of Hodge classes with positive coefficients. So therefore, this means that the Kähler cone intersect with the, with the neuron severity space lies in this cone of classes that has the ZOS property, which for us means that the extension property is going to hold for every Kähler form that is in the real neuron severity space. There are examples in uh, algebraic geometry of uh, manifolds V where the neuron severity space is everything, the whole H11 real cohomology group. And in those cases, it means that you get the extension property valid for every Kähler form on such a manifold V. So for example, Fano manifolds or rational manifolds and in particular toric manifolds are in this, in this category where you have the extension property going for every Kähler form. All right, so now I think we are at the last part of the talk. And the question is, uh, if you want to have the extension property going, are there any special properties that the class that you are looking at should have? So here is a definition. We are now working with general pseudo-effective classes, so they should contain positive closed currents. Or in other words, the class is like that precisely when there exists uh, theta plurisubharmonic function, otherwise there is nothing to talk about. So you say that this class has the extension property if this holds, if any theta plurisubharmonic function on X on the analytic subset extends to a global theta plurisubharmonic function on V. And this should hold for any irreducible analytic subset X. And then there is a stronger extension property that turns out to, to be needed. So you say that the class, pseudo-effective class again, has the bounded extension property. If, again, is required to hold for any analytic subset, so what you are trying to do is, if you have a theta plurisubharmonic function on the analytic subset x that is bounded below near some point of x, you require to have a theta plurisubharmonic extension to V that is going to be bounded near that point, but in an open neighborhood of the point in V. So at a point, you want to preserve this bounded below property. And a proposition that we have in the same paper from last year, this year, with Vincent Gage and Ahmed Zeriahi, is that if you have a projective manifold, dimension two or more, and a non-zero pseudo-effective class. If the class has the extension property, then the class should be NEF. And if it has the bounded extension property, then the class must be Kähler. All right, so this uh, originates with the uh, result of Matsumura in 2013. So this is after our paper with Gage and Zeriahi appeared with the extension property in Hodge classes, he proved a, a converse. So in the algebraic case, when you have a pseudo-effective line bundle on a projective manifold and non-trivial churn class, then 
if you assume that the churn class has the extension property, then L must be ample. And following his, uh, his method, so his proof at some point uses the nakai Moisheson criterion to establish that the class is the, I mean that the churn class is the class of an ample line bundle. And uh, in the transcendental case, when you start with just uh, a Kähler form, not, not coming from a line bundle necessarily, then uh, Meng and Wang, last year, paper appeared this year again, follow the proof of Matsumura, and instead of the Nakai Moisheson criterion, they use the Demai Poon characterization of the, of the Kähler cone. And here's their result. So you start with a pseudo-effective class, non-trivial, and the extension property that they require is that, well, I mean, you want to make here, of course, the assumption as, uh, as weak as possible. This is why it's so lengthy. So the extension property is required only from uh, Riemann surfaces, so from smooth complex curves in X you should be able to extend strictly plurisubharmonic functions on the curve C that have a single analytic singularity at some point. So they should extend to theta plurisubharmonic functions on, uh, yeah, on, right. So I guess this is their notation. X is the manifold and C, I, I was calling this V. C is the object that you are extending from. But anyway, the point is that you require this extension to be continuous at any point on the curve except at P, where you have the single analytic singularity of, of your phi. And in this case, replacing Nakai Moshe zone by the Demaipon characterization, they can follow the proof of Matsumura and establish this result. And I'm going to discuss our proof of re the related proposition 8. And in fact, there is no need to use this, but we use, of course, at many steps, the regularization theorem of, of Demai again. Okay, so five minutes probably, yeah. All right, so let's fix a Kähler form on V. So maybe I should recall this proposition. Yeah, here it is, so that's what we want to look at. So if the pseudo-effective class has the extension property, then the class is NEF. And then the second claim is if you have this extra extension property, then it's a Kähler class. So we fix a Kähler form on, uh, on V, and we take a representative of alpha, smooth, closed one on form, etc. And because the class is pseudo-effective, we can find the theta plurisubharmonic function, which is negative on V. And uh, again, we are using ideas from the proof of Matsumura. So the starting point is to notice that if you have curves that are smooth and they are complete intersection of n minus 1 ample divisors, then the restriction of the class to such a curve must be Kähler. And here is the short argument for this. So the divisors are ample, so you have a smooth Hermitian metric on dj, so that the curvature is a Kähler form. And then you have this lelong poincare formula that tells you that the current of integration on the divisor is equal to the curvature of the metric that you, that you fixed, and plus the, this is the potential, the omega j plurisubharmonic function, the logarithm of the pointwise norm of the canonical section that is zero on, on dj. Now, uh, because the intersection is assumed to be complete, then you can intersect the currents of integration, thanks again to results of Demai and Fornes and Siboni, and you do this by the wedge product defined inductively in the well-known way, and it gives you the current of integration on the curve C. And from here, one can conclude quickly. So you want to show that when you integrate theta on C, you get a positive number. That's what it means that uh, theta is Kähler class on C. The cohomology is one dimensional, one on cohomology. And simply because you have complete intersection, this reduces to this. 
And uh, the point is that these are Kähler forms, so they dominate some small multiple of omega v. And you get this bound. And here you are using the fact that the class alpha, the class of theta, is not 0. So this cannot be 0. And you get the first claim. And then the next point that is used is a, is a Bertini theorem due to Zhang from 2009, which says that there are plenty of curves C like that. In fact, so projectivity is used already many times, right? I was talking about divisors uh, that are ample, and now uh, again in this Bertini theorem. If you have two different points of the manifold V, you can always join them by a smooth Riemann surface, by a smooth curve, which is the complete intersection of ample divisors. All right, so with these two remarks, one can proceed in the following way. So you want to establish that uh, extension property implies nefness. And for this, one can use a, pluri a theta plurisubharmonic function with minimal singularities, as was observed again by, by Demai. So here it is. You take the supremum of all theta plurisubharmonic functions that are negative on V, and then you regularize to make it upper semi-continuous. And this is such a function. And the point is that this function is, is finite at each point. So it has zero along numbers. And for this, you use the extension property. So you fix a point in V, take any curve as above that contains the point. And because the restriction of theta or of the class alpha, more precisely, to C is scalar, you have smooth theta plurisubharmonic functions on the curve. And then you take one of them and you extend it you extend it to C. And subtracting a constant, you can make everything negative. And this extension phi gives you a competitor for psi theta for this uh, function with minimal singularities. And it tells you that at the point that was arbitrary, this function is not minus infinity. So like I said, it, had, it has 0 along number everywhere. Then the regularization theorem of Demai produces theta plus epsilon omega plurisubharmonic functions, where epsilon goes to 0, and these guys decrease to, to, to psi theta. Well, these are smooth, because their Lelong number is below this Lelong number. So it's 0, and they are supposed to have analytic singularities. So that makes them smooth. And then by adding a little bit more of the Kähler form, you see that your class alpha is approximated by Kähler classes, so therefore it's, it's NEF. All right, so this is the, par the first part where uh, extension property was used. And now in the, in the second, I'm again jumping twice, OK. In the second part, we want to show that it's scalar if you have the bounded extension property. And uh, here is the claim that is needed with a simple construction again. So the claim is that for every point of the manifold V, you find the bounded theta plurisubharmonic function, depending on the point, of course, psi sub p, which has actually positive uh, curvature. So theta plus DDC psi p dominates the Kähler form that you fixed in some neighborhood WP of p. So to see this, you fix some coordinate ball centered at p, and then Theta is a smooth form, so for some large positive constant, clearly DDZ z squared multiplied by A will kill whatever negative part theta has, so it will dominate the Kähler form in this fixed ball. And now you look at this compact set, so the complement of this open ball, and you take a point there, and you can join this arbitrary point to the point P, the center of the ball, by, by the curve. And you know that along this curve, alpha is a Kähler class. This allows you to construct functions that have one pole, in fact, with positive Lelong number at p. And we don't need much more of them than just that they are bounded below near q. So this is very easy to see, I guess, what you do. You just take, let's say, in a coordinate chart at p, you take a logarithm of a modulus of z if p was equal to 0. And then you multiply by a smooth cutoff function, and you extend it. 
and uh, near P, this is, of course, plurisubharmonic, so you don't need to worry. And if you multiply by a small epsilon, this whole thing, it is going to be uh, theta plurisubharmonic along C because you have a Kähler class. So that gives you this, uh, this function. And now by the bounded extension property, this function little u extends, so there is a theta plurisubharmonic function capital U sub Q on the manifold V, which extends little u, and is going to be bounded, so in some neighborhood of Q in V, you are bigger than some constant, depending on Q, of course, I didn't really go to these notations here, C depend on Q. After that, of course, you take a finite cover of this compact set by such neighborhoods, and you will take the maximum of these guys. So we go to the, yeah, here we are. Okay, so the maximum, and to this maximum you add a sufficiently large constant, and it gives you a theta plurisubharmonic function on V, which is positive on the complement of the ball, but it's still minus infinity at the point because all of those points were minus infinity. We extended, in each case, a function that had a pole at, at P. And then you do a gluing construction. By the choice of A, this function is theta plurisubharmonic, and uh, phi, which is, of course, positive outside of the ball, dominates this quantity, which is zero, on the, on the sphere of radius R. So this is a bounded theta plurisubharmonic function as we wanted, and in some smaller ball, because phi is minus infinity at p, in some smaller ball it coincides with this, so therefore its curvature is bigger than the Kähler form. And that's the proof of the claim, and now to conclude the argument, you cover the compact manifold by finitely many such WPs, and you take the average of those functions that are constructed, it's again a bounded theta plurisubharmonic function, and each point in the manifold belongs to some such open set, and the corresponding C has, of course, positive curvature there. Well, the other guys are positive, so you get a bit less positivity, but it's enough. So here it's a bounded theta plurisubharmonic function dominating a multiple of the Kähler form, and you apply the my regularization one more time to get a, a smooth function losing a bit of possibility, and that's your Kähler form in the class. So I guess I, I stop here. Thank you. <laughs>